All right, I think we can get started. Okay. All right, okay, so week seven, finally, we are, it's time to learn CNN, Convolutional Neural Network. It's been, we've took some time until we've, uh, we've reached here. Uh, that's, I mean, CNN is such a, such a, like a fundamental backbone module for all modern deep learning networks, deep learning models. And the reason I took some time, the reason that we took some time before we get here is because I thought it might be a good idea to go with the basic ones. And I mean, first of all, go through all the like, you know, basic machine learning, like back propagation and, and overfitting, underfitting, all that basic concepts, and then move progressively towards convolutional neural network, which is kind of like modality specific because autoencoders, VAEs, GANs, they are actually mod modality agnostics, which means that you can use VAEs for generating text or generating images or whatever. I mean, even though we've, we've used images so far, like GANs, we used Im image, we, we've used GANs to generate images. We've, we've used autoencoders to app compress images and all that because that's because images are just easier to you know it's visually more appealing it's more understandable but in principle you can use all those autoencoders VAEs GANs to you know handle or process any modality even tabular data whatever whatever you want uh, but convolutional neural network it's usually used for images so I think it's kind of makes sense that we dive into CNNs a, a bit later than autoencoders and all that Right, so we have uh, quite a bit of ground to cover today. And as I've said in the classroom, uh, this, this slide, this slide that consists of materials from three different classes in three different cl classes from Stanford CS231N, which is a computer vision, a computer vision course. Uh, yeah, I've just made a, like a like a mix and match. So I mean, the CS two three one and it's it goes into quite a bit of in depth for all the topics, which is quite unnecessary for our purposes. So I just took some took some materials from here and there and just made a collage. All right. So the topics today are, of course, CNN, and then the move on to training techniques. I'm going to talk about batch norm and dropout, which is not really specific for CNNs, but they are they were proposed to be used for training deep convolutional neural networks for image recognition or image classification. So I'm going to talk about batch norm and dropout. And then after that, I'm going to talk about popular architectures, VGGNet, uh, InceptionNet, ResNet, um, in that order, uh, which is also temporally uh, al aligned. Uh, not sure if we can get to CNN architectures today, but and if we can't, then I'm gonna spend maybe 20 minutes or so in the next practice session to talk about the popular architectures and then start the practice session. If not, I mean, if we can, if we can cover all these topics today, then good for us. And of course, I'm gonna talk about project one, maybe, maybe about five minutes at, at the end of the class today. All right, moving on. So comments. Uh, well, I mean, people say that confidence are biologically motivated, so I just prepared the slide. Uh, it is said that the architecture of multi-layer convolution, convolutional, convolutional neural network resembles the uh, how brains are constructed, human brains are constructed, or, or I guess animal brains are constructed. So in animal brains, uh, it, it is said that when you visually perceive something like you, like the, the light photons come into your eye and then retina and then like it fires a electronic signal, which is fired all the way back to like to the V1 area of your visual cortex. And uh, it has a hierarchy. So there's V1, V2, V4, IT, such and such. And it, uh, I'm not really sure if this is like 100% true or if like how scientists found, 
found the, the working mechanism of the visual cortex, but it is said that uh, in the lower hierarchy, like such as in V1, it perceives uh, lower concept, like lower visual, like vision, visual recognition, uh, such as like edges and lines, like here. It's a very like fundamental, like elemental, elementary operation. Like if there's like a certain texture or a certain uh, boundary or something like that. And then after that, in the higher, a bit of a, if you go uh, a, a one letter up the hierarchy, then it starts to recognize shapes like circular or, or rectangular or something like that. And then after that, it starts to uh, recognize objects. And then after that, it recognizes faces. So it's a hierarchy. Like you might, uh, for example, you might, uh, uh, the V1 region might recognize like like shape like this, and then after that, it might recognize like recognize an eye, and then it might recognize a partial a partial face like like here, and after that, it might recognize a full like full face. I mean that that's the theory. I'm not really sure if this if the whole brain is constructed in such a uh, clear cut manner. Not sure if that's true, but I, at least that's that's how it's supposed to work. So, uh, stack like multi-layer convolutional neural network kind of works in this way. If you look at the feature, if you look at the activation maps and the filters and all that, kind of resembles how brains are working. So that's the that's the biological motivation of a confidence. Right, so the history is confidence are pretty, it's a pretty old concept. So it started in 19, 1998, which is about 22 years ago, uh, proposed by Jan Lekun, which is like the three or maybe four, like one of the giants of deep learning. You can see very popular names, names here, like Leon Buteau, Yosha Benjo, they were all there in the beginning. So they're all like really, you know, they've been around for quite, quite some time. And they have did a lot of fundamental like impact impactful words, even back in the days, even before like all the deep learning uh, renaissance and all that, they were there working on fundamental problems. So come, uh, if you like in the today's standard, it's a pretty uh, low, low level. I mean, it's a pretty small network compared to like how deep networks are these days. Like, you know, you use like hundred, hundred different layers of confidence, but this is only, I guess, two layer layer convolution. There's like convolutional operation here. There's sampling. There's another convolutional operation here. Then there's sampling. And then you do, you add the fully connected layer and then you have the final uh, final output class. Like, you know, if it's an MNIST, there's zero, one, two, three. If it's ImageNet, there's like dog cats and cars and stuff, such and such. So this is called Linet5. And uh, this is AlexNet, which is quite a bit deeper compared to Linet. Uh, it was proposed in 2012, and this is the uh, the model that sparked the uh, the renaissance, the deep learning renaissance. Uh, this won the the engine challenge in 2012 using the neural network. And uh, it's I, how many layers are there? There's like one, two, one. There's like okay, so. Uh, I guess this is one layer, two, three, four, five, five layer. Okay, so five convolutional neural networks and two fully connected and the final 1000 classes because it's using internet. Even this is like small, not, it's not small. Actually, the number of parameters is pretty, pretty huge compared to even compared to like ResNet or InceptionNet. AlexNet is a very bulky network. It's just that it's not as efficient as, as the other like modern networks like ResNet. It just uses way more parameters, but the accuracy is not as good. So, but this was like the very first deep learning model. And these days, and covenants are just everywhere. So it's just the basic fundamental backbone module for processing anything image related. And even for a text and time series, like your speech audio, audio signals or your, uh, or your for speech recognition for ev everything, it's just, it's used for everything. Basically, it's just a sequence encoder. You have a sequence, you have a 1D sequence, you use 1D CNN. If you have 2D sequence, such as images, you use 2D CNN. If you have 3D sequence, 
such as videos or MRI scans or CT scans, you use 3D convent. So it's, you can, it can be used for any, uh, any sequence, basically. So yeah, uh, Im uh, image classification, uh, image retrieval, like, you know, given an image, retrieve any, like, you know, find, find an image that is as close as possible to the given image. So like if you give an elephant, it'll find elephants for you. And um, boundary detection, so or object object detection. So if you have, if you give an, give a image to the model, then it'll recognize certain interesting objects, like inter objects of interest. Uh, so there's a car, there's a dog, a person, a horse, a person, something like this. I mean, it, it won't recognize every single stuff. I mean, I mean, there's like grass here, there, there's ground, but that's not, of interest, uh, it only uh, it only recognizes certain things, and then this, of course, used for pixel level segmentation as well. So, given a image like this, given an image like this, uh, your your model can uh, color each pixel and classify it to a certain class. So, like this entire thing is is a road, and this entire thing is is a tree, something like this, and. Uh, uh, it, is, it is even used for image captioning. So given an image, you can generate captions like a white teddy bear sitting in the grass, which is a perfect caption. Uh, here, given this woman image, the, the woman is holding a cat in her hand, which is, which is, I guess, I mean, there, there's a woman, but we don't know if she's holding a cat in her hand because we can't see that. So it's only partially related. Uh, by the way, we are going to, we are going to do that. We're going to, learn this model which can do image captioning and we can actually we're going to actually implement it and train it in the maybe week i don't know week, week 10 or week week 11 i forgot anyway we're going to do this so it's going to be interesting uh even style transfer so given a image of a house or three houses you can tra transfer the uh the uh, drawing style into like van gogh style or what what is this this is like Munch's at Ed, Edvard Munch's style, I guess. I'm not really sure. And some other style, like you know, given the image, you just tr transfer to your a style of your liking. So even here, confidence are used, of course, because there's it's an image, so there's always confidence involved. All right. So just going into a bit of a technical details now. So the reason that confidence are so you know it's a great concept is because if you think about handling an image of a resolution 32 by 32. So you have a 32 by 32 resolution uh, image. And of course it's, an, it's a color image. So there's three channels, which is three channels here, which is RGB. So if you look at JPEGs or like PNGs or whatever, like if, you, if you're given an image, it's always, uh, did something happen here? Did someone raise a hand or something? Yeah, I can't. I think something happened. I just can't. Don't understand what what just happened. All right, just moving on. So yeah, as I said, if you have a thirty-two by thirty image with three channels RGB, and if you happen to use, I mean, so far we've only learned about fully connected networks. So if you try to use that, then you need to spread your thirty-two by thirty-two by three three images into a very long horizontal vector, which would be 3,072 dimensional vectors. So for example, we've talked about MNIST images a lot, which was 24 by 24, 24 by 24. So MNIST was 24 by 24 with channel, one channel because it's a white, a black or white image, just a grayscale image. So we don't have any red or any you know, color element there. So 24 by 24 by one, if you spread it out, if you just you know, flatten it to a long vector, then it's gonna be 780, 86, right? Similarly, if you spread this one out, it's going to be 3,000. And if you just use some, you know, some weight matrix, for example, if you want to classify this image, classify this image into 10 classes, then you need a 10 by 3,000 matrix, which is going to be really long. So like it's going to be like this long. So this is going to be 10. This is 3,072. And if you do a dot product or or matrix mul multiplication between the two, then you're going to get you're going to obtain a one by 10 vector as the outcome, which is of course, you know, 10 classes. And uh, the first class is going to be the outcome of doing a dot product or inner product between the first row 
and your very long image vector. So it's a dot product between the two, and then you get the first one. If you take the last row and do the inner product between this one and, and this one, you get the last element. So it's a very rather, rather as I guess, you know, naive or stupid way to approach an image because images have a certain spatial features. It has 32 by 32, which means it has a height and width and it has different color channels so like this, All right? So it's probably a bad idea to just sprint, just flatten everything out and just concatenate like this much is R, this much is G, this much is B, and no, fa no spatial feature is preserved. You just, you know, you take, you take this one and this one, and then you concatenate it. You take this one, concatenate it. If you take this one, to concatenate it. It's gonna be a very long vector. So, and just doing a simple dot product or inner product between the, uh, between the, uh, your, your weight vector with your input to get the final class prediction, not a good idea, right? Yeah, it's just a dot product. So uh, here comes the uh, convolutional layer, which is that it enables you to preserve the spatial features and do some whatever encoding that you that needs to be done. So there's a three channel. There's height and width, height and width. Three channel width and height, and then you take a for example there. So all the components have something called field filters. I mean these are all very well known concepts. So it might be too easy for for some of you, but if anyone here is it's their first time hearing about confidence, even like just, just you know, hearing the word confident, this might be very educational for you. So confidence usually have filters and there are certain, certain concepts that you need to learn. Filters, uh, filters or and strides and pooling and all that. Uh, we're gonna learn that one by one. So filters are sometimes called kernels and filters have, so filters are just the learnable weight, learnable parameters, just like, you know, you have weight vector or weight matrices in fully connected networks, there's a fil learnable filter in confidence. And it, that even has, the filter has a spatial feature. So filter, for example, it could be a five by five by five by three. May, maybe five, five by five by three. So even the filters have spatial features. And uh, it could be, and it could be, uh, it could be seven, it could be any, it could have any spatial uh, parameters. So it could be seven by seven by three, it could be seven by seven by three. It could be nine by nine by three, or it could be three by three by three. It's up to you. Uh, uh, the reason that we fixed the, uh, the last three is because the given image, the incoming image has three channels, RGB. So you want to, you want to have the same number of uh, channels in your filter as well. So it could, so, so we're just gonna roll, run with the five by five by three filter example. And how it works is it, it slides over, given a filter, it slides over the image uh, in, in, in a 2D manner. So, and uh, as I said, filters always extend the full depth. So depth meaning the channel here. So it must be the same. And so, uh, you just slide it over. Uh, I think there's, yeah, like here, I'm gonna just show you this first. So you have a filter, you have a filter. You start with the very first corner here. So given an image, given an image, you start with here. So 32 by 32. And this is your five by five filter. You slide it like here, one, two, three, four. You just slide it over till the end of your, your image. And then if you, if you finish the first row, if you finish the first row, you move one pixel down, you move one, one pixel down and then start with the second row and then you slide it over and again, and again, and again. And each time you slide your filter, what you do is you simply do a inner product between the region that the filter is currently in with the uh, filter, the parameters. So if you have, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, so suppose this is 32 by 32 and you have five by five filter. And what you do is there's a filter, I mean, there, there's a pixel intensity in this, in this region, right? If, we, if you think about this, is, this is the R channel. I mean, there will be three channels. There will be R and G and B. And the filter currently, the, the one we're looking at is sliding over the R channel. And in this region, 
in this in this region here. There will be a R red pixel intensities. So each uh, filter here, the fil each filter element will be a weight. It's, it's a parameter. You multiply the parameter with the pixel intensity in that in that in that in uh, in that position, and then you sum them up. So that's basically it. You sum them up. So it's a, a inner product between the pixels here, the 25 pixels here, with the pixel with the filter parameters or filter weights, and it's an inner product. And then you just add add the bias term. That's it. And then you just repeat it. You slide it, and then you move on to the next row. Next row, you slide it, slide it, slide it until you reach the very bottom here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You do this. So how many times do you need to do this? You need to do this like um, uh, 20, 27 times here, 20, 20, 28 times. So this is 32. So you can slide the five by five filter like 28 times. And then you do this for 28 rows. So it's like 28 times by 28. So you do this for like quite a number of, quite a number of times. And then you, so then you would obtain a, a smaller, smaller image after this. So, well, I mean, we'll get, We'll, we'll see how it works. But basically, the important thing is it's just a inner product between the, the filter and the, re, the pixels in that specific region and, and the bias term. That's it. All right, you slide it, slide it, slide it. And then the, finally, you obtain the activation map, or which is like a, a contracted image or contracted feature, if you would say. So, oh. because you've, uh, because you, you've, uh, your your filter is five by five, so you if you slide it over the thirty two by thirty two image, then it won't the outcome outcoming the the obtained feature vector or ac activation map won't be thirty two by thirty two, right? Because your your feature map can fit only so much into your thirty two by thirty two spatial feature. So the one that you obtain is going to be twenty eight by twenty eight, right? And uh, uh, oh, of course, and uh, that one, th so you have three, three by three, and then you convolve over everything, and then you add it, so that's why you get a one channel here, right? So you do, you do this for the R channel, you do this for the, B, the G channel, you just do this for the B channel, and then you add the ones that you've obtained from each channel, so that's why you get the final one channel output. Okay, so, so far, so good. This is like using only a single filter. And in usually in convolution neural net, you use hundreds of feet, hundreds of filters or hundreds of kernels. Uh, is it a convention to use filters with the same width and height or can you choose to use filters with different? That's an interesting question. It is certainly a convention to use the same width and height for your filter, like three by three or five by five. I'm not sure if there's a good reason to use three by seven or like five by nine or nine by five for that matter. I'm not sure if there's a good reason for that. It's an interesting concept though. But I, I've never seen a paper do that. Any, any like modern deep learning paper that uses uneven or unmatched height and width for your filter. Yeah, 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 Rushta, that's correct. You adding all three channels. Adding, so you, so you have three, three channels, R and G and B. Right, so there's R, G, and B, and you have different filters for each because it's a five by five by three filter. So there will be three different filters for R and G and B, and then you do the you do the uh, the, in, the inner product in the R channel, inner product in the G channel, inner product in the B channel, and then you add them all up, and that's why you get the final one channel. Uh, yeah, why it becomes twenty eight by twenty eight? We're gonna get to that later. Uh, there is going to be an example. Good filter number. That's just that's, that's a rule of thumb. You, I mean, the more channel, I mean, the more filter you use, like that means the more powerful or more expressive your model models uh, model is model becomes basically because you're using more parameters. So sooner or later, it's going to overfit. If you use like thousand different thousand different filters, it's going to overfit. So you don't want to. You don't want your model to overfit, right? So it's a basically rule of thumb. If like given a given the image resolution and the task that you want to do and the number of the and the volume of your data set 
and the size of your model, it all depends on those factors, like with what is the ideal number of filters per layer. Uh, so in ResNet, I think they start with 64 and then blow it up to 512, I think. Right, yeah, so as I said, so you use many, like hundreds of filters. So if you use another filter, so just note that the, the color here, it was a blue filter, now it's a, a rather green filter. So you, you, if you use another filter, then it's, you're gonna obtain another activation map, right? So if you use 100 filters, you're gonna obtain 100 different activation maps. Right, like just like here. So if you use six filters, so five by five by three, and you have six of them, right? And then you are gonna obtain six by 28 by 28 by six activation map. So, right, so yeah. So yeah, you know, note the change that there, it, we started with the three, we started with three channels, RGB, and now we have six channels, which semantically won't be RGB anymore. They will just contain different semantics of an image, like, you know, a different, like each filter can have their own rules. Like some filter will learn like boundary, diagonal boundaries like this. Another filter will learn horizontal boundary. Another filter will learn like vertical boundary, something like this in, in the very lower layer. And then each activation map will be the outcome of using that filter on the entire three, 32 by 32 by three image. Right, so, okay, as I said, I'm gonna talk about why it becomes, like why it's, why it's contracted from 32 to 28, but we're gonna to get to that later, so. What if each filter has different size? So that's a good question. I think Inception that uses that uh, paradigm. So it uses three by three, five by five, three, seven by seven at the same time for each layer, and then can, can, somehow merges it together, merges the outcome together to go to the another, to the next layer. Hopefully we're gonna talk about that today. I mean, if we can get to that topic. Right, okay, so we're, uh, all right. So the first layer was convolutional neural network. And of course, uh, it's not just, if you just use conv convolutional filter uh, to get to obtain the activation image, then it's gonna be a linear operation, right? Because we, don't, we haven't used any act nonlinear activation. So you need some, some non-activation unit. Typically it's ReLU, I mean, if you use sigmoid or 10h, you can't you can't use you can't blow it up to at least dozens of layers to begin with. So you tip, typically ReLU is the like the go-to activation map when you are stacking up multiple layers of convnets or convolutional layers. So you use you do the uh, wt w transpose x plus b using your filter and then you just activate it with a ReLU function. So it's conv convnet ReLU with six filters and you obtain this activation map activation feature which is 28 by 28 by 6 and then you do this again with another set of filters so it's going to be the next layer if you do this with another set of filters this time it's got to be five by five by six because the incoming incoming image or incoming features are 28 by 28 by six here so you have to match that channel number so five by five by six and suppose now you're using 10 different filters, then you would obtain 28, 24 by 24 by 10 now. 20, uh, so you, you see that six by six, the aligned number six and six here, 10, 10 here. And because you're using five by five filters, you're gonna obtain, you're, you're gonna contract the 28 by 28 to 24 by 24. And that depends on if you use three by three, then that the, you're gonna get different number. You're gonna get like 26 by 26, but we're gonna get to that later. So you do that, you do another, you repeat this process another time, then you're gonna get like 20 by 20 by some channel number and do that again and again and again, right? So yeah, so that's how you stack up like multiple layers of convolutional nets, convolutional layers. Right, so uh, there's something called receptive field that must be uh, talked about uh, when, you, when you use convlets. So this time, so uh, if, you, if you stack up multiple layers of convolutional layers, then the, the, the upper layer will be able to see a larger region from the bottom layer, which is conceptually that's called receptive field. So for example, let's say you're using three layers, three layers of three by three filter. Uh, channel number, we're gonna ignore that for now. So 
If you use three layers of three by three filter, so one, two, three, you do this three times. And in the final, in, in the final obtained image, uh, the activation map, so this is the activation map, the final activation map, a single pixel in the final activation map will be, will, will, is derived from three by three region in the, in, in the right beneath, in the layer right beneath, right? Because you're using a three by three by three filter. So this value here is obtained, is determined by image, pic, image pixels the pixel values in this three by three region, right? And again, again, one pixel here in this region is derived from three by three region in A1, the layer right beneath that, right? You do this again. So one, and the one pixel here is determined by three by three region here in the input. So that means one pixel here can see seven by seven region here. If you, if you, if you like progressively. So if you stack three, three by three convolute com three times, then it is equivalent to one pixel seeing or one pixel, the value of this one pixel being determined by all the pixels in the seven by seven region here. So that means it's, so the receptive field is, so the receptive field of this guy is the entire thing here. Like the entire thing, entire thing here. So as, as, as the sentence says, three layers of three by three filter has the same receptive field as a single seven by seven. Because if you, if you just, if you happen to use one layer of seven by seven, then this, re, the, this one pixel here will be looking at seven by seven region in the, in the input space, in, in the input image, right? But instead of doing that, you use three by, you use three layers of three by three and it has the same effect. So I hope that's, that, that's pretty clear. And the good thing about that is if you use seven by seven filter, seven by seven filter, that means you need to have 49 parameters. You need to learn 49 parameters, right? But if you use three, three by three filters, this is one seven by seven filter. So this is like the layer number. So this is layer, this is your filter. And if you use three layers of three by three filter, that's how many? That's 27, right? 27. So it, you, you can achieve the same effect. The single pixel looking at seven different, seven by seven receptive field, you can achieve that by using smaller number of parameters. Instead of using seven by seven, you are using, you're using three layers of three by three. And, has the same, and you can have the same, you can achieve the same thing using smaller, using less number of parameters and even deeper layers. Deeper means more nonlinear activation functions, more manipulate, more manipulations. So it's usually more advantageous to use like smaller size filters with deeper layer. So yeah, that's the lesson here. All right, so we've talked about how the human like brain visual cortex is supposedly constructed. You can see like similar effect in uh, multi-layer convolutional nets. So this is, uh, this is the uh, pixel, this is the filters from each layer in VGG16 net, which is a, which is a way, way deeper, which is a way deeper layer. Not, yeah, which is a deeper confident compared to AlexNet or Lunet. So this was uh, proposed in 2013. And this is like different layers. So layer one, layer two, layer three, I guess. Uh, and of course, as I said, the lower layer uh, has, is responsible for recognizing lower level features. So uh, I'm not sure how they, they visualized this, but it's like a, like a, like a filter. Uh, so each filter, as I said, each filter is course is responsible for detecting some boundary, like diagonal boundary, horizontal boundary, or maybe some, 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 some texture, like, 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 you know, uh, red fur or, or, or blue fur or green grass, something like that. So, uh, you can see that they are responsible for different colors, like red, some, uh, this one is responsible for like recognizing red color, yellow color. This one is responsible for recognizing 
horizontal horizontal something, I mean vertical something. And this one is responsible for recognizing some circular boundary, I guess, something like that. And then if you go one layer up, if you go to the mid-level features, then it, it's being it's more complicated. And then if you go one more one uh, like higher up, then it becomes even more complicated. So like each filter is each filter is like playing the role of more complex rec visual recognition, basically. Right, uh, you can see the same thing in the, uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, so given an uh, image, this is like the headlight of a car, I think, right? So it's like you're, you're fr maybe it's the back side of the car or maybe it's the front side of the car, but basically it's some, some headlight. And given this image, you can apply a lot of filters because you have like, how many filters there are. So there's 32 filters of five, 32 different five by five filters. And as I said, each filter will be responsible for recognizing certain boundaries or colors or texture. So if you apply this filter on this image, then you get this activation map. And if you apply this filter on this image, then you get this activation map. And they have different activation, obviously, because you're using different filters. But here you can quite see the, the shape here, the, like the uh, like like the rectangular shape here is is still here, like rectangular shape, and like the headlight here is, is the headlight here. So, uh, so this one is pretty. This one, the, this filter is a pretty good filter for recognizing the boundary. Uh, this one, I, I guess not. It's for it's serving a different purpose, I guess. All right, uh, so, okay, so some questions. Does the same size many filters have different meaningful filters? Yeah, as I said, as I said, so yeah, here they have all, they're all 30, uh, they're all five by five filter and there are 32 of different one of them. And you can see they're responsible for different, different roles, right? And how does the guarantee that different filters do different jobs? That's a good question. Uh, it just happens to be working that way. You don't have to add uh, additional loss term in your objective function. It just happens that it just happens to be that if you use different num if you use like 32 different filters, then each will serve different roles because in order to in order to minimize a certain objective function like cross entropy or ne negative log likelihood or whatever. What if you're doing re image recognition, then you need to maximize the classification accuracy. If you're doing reconstruction, then you need to max you need to min minimize the art uh, minimize the L2 loss. Some you have some loss always, right? And if in order to minimize a loss, each filter will just happen to serve a different role because each filter, first of all, they will be initialized with different random seed. So they will have different starting value and they they will evolve into serving different roles, basically. Uh, 32, not 32 layers. This is 32 filters in one layer. Yeah. It's one layer, 32 filters. All right. I hope I hope that's uh, that answers the questions. Moving on. Uh, so yeah. So this is what is this? This is a. I don't think this ResNet. This is probably uh, some rather small convent. So you have convent ReLU, convent ReLU. So that's two convolutional layers. There's a pooling operation, which we'll talk about. Then there's another convolu, convolu, pull, convolu, con so there's like six different convolutional operations or convolutional convolution layers. And then finally, so it, it's a very simple CNN architecture basically is for image classification. Like given an image, you do six different convolutional, you, you put it through six different convolutional layers. And then at the final layer, you do a simple fully connect, you add a simple fully connected layer at the, at the final layer. And then you classify it into different objects like cars or trucks, airplane, ship, horse. So this is like a canonical architecture of simple CNN, multi-layer CNN. And we're gonna learn all the uh, all the components. So far we've learned only ConValu component and then we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk about pool and FC, of course, as well. Uh, the question, so convolution layer filters are 10 layers, so convolution layer is 10 layers. Uh, in this in this example, yes. So here there are 
one, two, three, four, five, another five, so it's 10, yeah. Suppose that you, you can suppose that this convolutional, this CNN architecture is using 10 different filters throughout the entire six layers. You can, you can suppose that, yeah. All right, moving on. So the reason that it is you're obtain, you obtain 28 by 28, uh, in 28 by 28 activation map after you apply five by five filter is now we're going to talk about that the, the spatial uh, the, the spatial factors here all right so we're going to just simplify the architecture a bit so let's for example say that you are given a seven by seven input so height and width seven by seven, and you're using a three by three filter this time. So seven by seven input, three by three, and just forget about the channel right now. Let's just say it's a single channel input. So you're sliding your three by three filter over the image. So one, two, three, four, five, five times, right? So you've, you can only slide your three by three filter five times horizontally, because of course, you know, you, you can't go overboard. I mean, you, you if you slide, if you try to slide it, then there's no more, there's no more pixel there, right? So you, you can't go like like this. So if you want to stay inside a given image, if you want to stay inside the given image, you can only slide it five times horizontally. And in the same print, in the same same sense, you can only slide it five times vertically as well. So you can start from here and then you can move on to here, 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 here. So again, five five times. So in total, you're gonna obtain, you're gonna do the uh, inner product between the pixel the pixel information, the pixel values and your filter 28, 25 times, five by five times. So that's why you uh, obtain the output of five by five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, for, and this pixel here, this value here, is obtained from obtained from obtained from this region here. This is here, right? And of course, this one is coming from here, right? So that's why you have five by five out output. And in the same in the same manner, if you apply a five by five filter on twenty on thirty two by thirty two image, you get twenty eight by twenty eight uh, activation map. Question: During the process of changing from matrix strict structure to vectorization for classification, I wonder spatial information doesn't lose. No, you're going to lose spatial information because so you've constructed a repeated layers of convolutional operation, convolutional operation, and then when you finally flatten it to a 1000 vector. Well, I mean, I mean, it depends on how many fully connected layers you use before the final classification. But if you use some, like if you use five, like four, let's suppose that you use four layers of fully connected layers before you do final classification, then you are losing the spatial features, right? And then maybe that's not a good idea. So these days you don't use fully connected layers as often as like, you know, before, as often as before, before meaning like AlexNet or, or uh, VGGNet. We're gonna talk about that as well. All right, moving on. So yeah, uh, so another interesting thing, another uh, important thing that you need to note is something called stride. So, so far, so far, you've only moved your filter one pixel at a time. So one, like one, and then you move, you move one pixel to the right one pixel to the right, one pixel to the right, one pixel to the right. So that was stride one. But if you use stride two, then you're jumping two pixels at a time like this. So you've, it's not here. It's, it's not here, right? It is now here, right? The difference between the first one and the second one is just, is two pixels. So that is why you call it stride two. And uh, yeah. Uh, there, there's a reason for using stride two. Actually, you want to may, maybe you want to obtain a smaller activation map. If you use stride two, then how many times can you do the inner product between the uh, the image input image and the filter? It, you can only do it three times, right? One time here, another time here, and the final 
the final operation here. So you only get three by three output, nine, pick nine in total, three by three output when you use stride two. So sometimes you want to maybe, you know, contract your image a bit more than using stride one. So maybe you want to obtain not five by five, but three by three output. Then you want to, you might want to use stride two or maybe even stride three, which by the way, I haven't seen a lot. Sometimes people use stride two. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen stride three, but again, I'm not a, I'm not an image expert. So who knows? All right, moving on. So uh, yeah, stride three, stride three, if you think about it, stride three might not work too well here because if you jump one time, then you're gonna end up you're gonna end up here, right? But if you jump another time, then you have to be like here, uh, which quite doesn't work. Like you won't be able to cut. You're gonna miss this region if you use stride three, right? So you you're, you when you use, when you when you adjust the the size of the stride, you have to think about the size of your image and the size of your filter to to guarantee that you're using all the all the pixels at, as as much as possible. So yeah, sometimes yeah. So in this in this specific example, stride three probably not a good idea. So it doesn't fit. So there's a, a simple equation that enables you to calculate the size of your output or activation map. Like how like whether you're gonna get three by three or five by five, depending on the input image the size of your input image, the size of your filter, and the, and the value of your stride. So size of your input, size of your filter, and the value of your stride. And if you use this equation, then you're gonna, you're, you, can, uh, you can obtain the size of your output activation map. So for example, if you have uh, input image of seven by seven and filter by three by three, and you use stride one, then you use this, uh, equation and you obtain five, which means that you're going to get five by five activation map. If you stride two, then you're going to get three by three output. And if you use uh, stride three, which doesn't fit, then you get you get a, a like sub uh, sub decimal value, so which is not a good idea. So you can use stride one and two. So okay, 그냥 한글로 답을 드리자면 그러니까 예를 들어서 이제 컨분해서 이만 이미지가 있고 이거 이제 컨버넷에 막 이렇게 컴뭐 여섯 번의 컨볼루션 레이어 이제 학습을 시킨 통과를 시킨 다음에 마지막에 뭐 풀리 커넥티드 레이어를 한세번좀 통과시키고 마지막에 이제 뭐열 클래스짜리 아웃풋을 쓴다 열 클래스짜리 클래스피케이션을 한다 그럼 이때는 여기서 열심히 모아놨던 스페셜 피처를 다 펴버리니까 이렇게 풀리 커넥티드 펴버리니까 이제 그 스페셜 인포메이션을 잃어버리게 된다는 거죠 근데 이제 이게 당연히 아, 좋을 수도 있고 나쁠 수도 있는데 요즘 아키텍처들은 이제 이런 것들 점점 안 하는 추세입니다. 이런 풀리 커넥티드 레이어를 안 쓰는 추세예요. 예전에 VGG 넷이나 뭐 알렉스 넷은 썼었는데 요즘 거는 안 쓰는 추세입니다. 네, 아, 누군가 또 새로 참가하셨나 본데 한번 뮤트를 하겠습니다. Okay, so moving on. So there's a, actually a trick that enables you to obtain the same resolution for your output output activation map as the input image. So that is called padding. So for example, let's say you have a seven by seven. So seven by seven here, seven by seven. But you want, and you are, you, you're using three by three filter, but you want to obtain seven by seven activation map, not five by five. You want to, you want to preserve, you want to retain the, uh, the spatial resolution in the activation map. So in that, when, and, and you can use padding to do that, to achieve that goal. So you just uh, you just upsize your image by adding a lot of zeros in the boundary. So you add one, like a lot of zero, 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 like all, these are all zeros here. So this has effectively become a nine by nine image right now, right? So there's, oh, sorry, sorry about that. It should be, oh yeah, it is nine. So yeah, nine by nine. So now it, your seven by seven image has become nine by nine image with, uh, your boundary being all zeros. And then you, if you apply three by three filter, then obviously you're gonna get seven by seven output, right? So uh, this is how you can preserve the, uh, preserve the, uh, the dimensionality between the input and the output. So uh, 
yeah, you want you you need to do this actually if you want to use residual. If you want to what like ResNet, you there's a certain scenario or circumstances when you must preserve the dimensionality between the input and the output when you want to use skip connections or or also known as res residual connections. Uh, padding and putting yeah, on padding is usually done with zeros. If you use one, then it means there's some pixel value. So, you, I mean, if you consistently use ones for your pad, for your padding, then your network will learn to adapt to that. But if you, it's just a common practice to use zeros. Right. So, so yeah, if you pad it, you get seven by seven output. Yeah, so here uh, the equation has changed from, from, from here to here, which means that you need to add uh, uh, like the padding size. So you are, the padding size is one and you have, you have this for like both left and right and top and bottom, so it's 2P. So now your equation has changed. Yep, so if you use uh, filter three, then you need to zero pad with one. So zero pad with one mean, meaning that uh, your your border the 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 uh, uh, yeah the size of your border must be one basically so when you use filter size three by three and you want to retain the dimensionality uh, then your padding size must be one and if you use five by five filter then your padding size must be two so there must be another zero pads on that on another in the outer layer like like an insulation there must be another zero a lot of zeros here. If you want to use five by five filter and retain dimensionality. And in the same manner, if you want to use seven by seven filter and keep keep the dimensionality, then you need to zero pad your image with three, the three like layers, three insulation layers. Right, uh, filter and bias parameter. And then, yes, so as I said, uh, I guess you missed that part. There's a bias parameter. Yeah, so it's just same. It's just one parameter. It's just one one weight that is added to to all, all the all the pixel. Like basically, this is your scalar. So this is inner product. So this is your scalar. So this must be scalar, right? Okay, so time to do some calculation. So it's an example time. Uh, okay, some question. Does padding affect the feature of the image like the edge or something or the effect is, oh yeah, it's, it, this effect is negligible because you're always zero padding all the time. So then your model will pick up the signal that your outer layer, outer like border line is always zero. So it learn, it'll learn to ignore that information. So it's negligible. You're padding your sign of straight through to knowledge and go to the. You could do that. So, Sojong Nim, you could do that. You can use padding to use higher value, like larger value of your for your stride. But I'm not sure if people do that very often. But you could do that theoretically. All right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, pop quiz time. So if you have a input of size three, 32 by 32 with three channels and you're using 10, 10 five by five filters with stride one and pad two, what would be your output volume size? Like what is your, what is the dimensionality of your activation map? Can you, can you calculate that? Thirty-two by thirty-two by ten. Yep, that is correct. Thirty-two by thirty-two by ten. Yeah, we are retaining the dimensionality. I mean, the height and width because we've added pad two, and the output channel is ten, right? So actually, there should be another information here, which is five by five by three. We need to uh, we need to match the uh, channel size with the input channel. So, yep, yeah, it's thirty two by thirty two by ten. Uh, this is a bit of a. Uh, a rote, a rote calculation question. So if you have 10 five by five by three filters 
then what's the number of parameters in this layer? Which is quite, uh, which is quite easy to actually calculate. 250, uh, are you really sure? 250, 750, 760. Uh, yeah, so five by five by three by 10. So five times, five times, three times 10 is the correct answer when you don't consider the bias term. If you do consider the bias term, then Jun Lee got the right, right answer, 760. The, the bias term here, 760. So com coming, uh, considering like the size of the filter and like how many, like the base, considering the output, which the output was, output was 32 by 32 by 10, right? Considering the output, you are not, you're not using that many parameters. Re I mean, relatively. Relatively, uh, like if you if you were to use a fully connected layer to convert your thirty two by 30, 32 by ten three into thirty two by thirty two by ten, then you would need way more parameters than seven hundred sixty, right? So that's the advantage, or that's why Convenant actually works. It is respecting the local features in your input, and you're using the same filter across the entire image. So you have a single filter that convolves or gathers inform pixel information in this specific region. And then that becomes your output, oh, sorry, your output, uh, output feature, right? And you use the same filter across all the, Im all across the entire image. And then you get a one, output activation map. So, and then you use another filter to, to, to do that. So basically if you have, if for example, if your first filter is for recognizing horizontal, I mean, diagonal, uh, diagonal boundary and your another, your second filter is responsible for recognizing horizontal, horizontal uh, boundary. And the third one for recognizing vertical boundary, then each activation map will have, will have the output value given the image. So the first activation map will be, what would it be like to recognize only the diagonal boundaries in your given image? That will be your first activation map. Your second activation map will be, what would it be like to recognize only the horizontal boundary in your given image? That will be your second activation map. Third, third activation map, obviously, what would it be like to recognize only the vertical boundary in your given image? And if you use 64 different filters and there will be 64 different types of output act activation map. Uh, bias is all the components are still being applied. You can see it, but one filter is one and bias is one. Right, I hope that makes sense why convenance or using filters is a reasonable or is, is, is a like it's a way better approach for processing images compared to using fully connected layer all right so the, that's just just a bunch of summary so if you have like number of filters if it, so number of filters number of filter size number of the size of the stride uh, the size of the padding then you can obtain you know uh, you can obtain like the size of your output activation map. And the common settings are, so the number of filters, like how many filters you want to use per layer is usually power of two. So 32 or 64, 128, 512, it's up to you. And the size of the filter is usually three or five. You, you rarely use seven by seven filters these days. And stride is either one or two. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the padding, of course, if you want to retain this dimensionality, then you have to use padding one for three, filter size three, padding two for filter size five, such and such, right? I uh, actually may, maybe it might be a bit of a strong claim that I, what I just said, like people rarely use seven by seven filter. Might, maybe there's a purpose for using them seven by seven filter for, for some specific tasks. So I can't, yeah, let, just forget that I, I said that. Uh, 
아, 네. 그 소식을, 네, 나중에 보시면 아시겠지만, 일단 필터랑, 필터에 있는 파라미터랑 픽셀들을 이너 프로덕트를 하기 때문에 스케일러 밸류가 나오거든요. 그 스케일러 밸류랑 그냥 바이오스를 더해주는 겁니다. 네. 그래서 어떻게 보면 이제 바이오스 하나가 픽셀 하나당 더해진다고 보셔도 됩니다. 네. Alright, so, yeah. These four things are important for defining your or constructing your convolutional neural networks. So when you use like PyTorch, you need to define these parameters, these hyperparameters, like how many filters you want to use, size of your filter, the size of the value of your stride, how many, like the zero padding, all that. You need to give this information to your PyTorch code in order to construct your confidence. So, yeah. Uh, and there's something called a one by one, one by one convolution operation, which might seem weird because usually you want to you want to have like a patch filter move around your entire feature, right? So what does it mean to have a one by one filter? What does that mean? It means that you're only looking at one pixel value at a time, right? Uh, which might be weird. Uh, but it is it is using a it is it serves a specific purpose for example let's say that you're using one by one filter uh we forgot the 64 here though so there's 64 because your your incoming image has 64 channels 56 by 56 width and height and if you use one by one by 64 convolutional filter and you, if you have 32 of them, if you have 32 filters, if you're using 32 filters, then your output, your outcome would be, of course, your dimension, your height and width will be preserved because you're using, you're sliding one by one filter through the, throughout the entire image. So your output will, of course, have 56 by 56 dimensionality, but your output channel will be 32 because you're using 32 filters right you're using 32 different filters so what what effectively what effectively happened here is you've compressed your channel size from 64 to 32 that's the only thing that changed and obviously you're using convolution filters so uh your your one by one by 64 convolutional filter have done some some cal calculation and it did some convolution on, on its own, even though it's only one by one. And that becomes your uh, feature here. This, that's from one filter. And if you, then this, the second one is from another filter. And this one is from the six, 32, the 30 second fil filter, 30, 30 second filter, yeah. This one is from 30 second filter. Uh, so basically uh, it has the effect of contracting the, the channel space. All right, some, uh, yeah, so yeah, basically this one, this five, we call this fiber uh, in, in the activation map. When you, when you talk about the activation map, a single pixel has a channel space. So we call this entire, entire one by one by channel a fiber and your fiber has contracted channel wise. So 64 has become 32. So that's the kind of the role that one by one con convolution layer plays. All right, some questions. So, five, the all by all image or all by all filter that plot comes scale option. Now, right? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So the question is, if you're given in, if your input image is not, is not square, but rectangular, is this still a good idea to use square filter? And probably the answer is yes, because your filter is actually just, it's a function that, uh, that recognizes a certain visual feature in a given patch or given region. So the fact that your input is rectangular is just that it has nothing to do with you know, visual features. It's just that it has more height or more width. And it's just that your your image is just horizontally longer or, or vertically longer. And doesn't, and bec just because your image is like, you know, rectangular doesn't mean that the visual features are also 
skewed. So what, what I'm saying is, uh, this is your square feature and it has a person like this. Just because your image, input image, like horizontal longer, doesn't mean that your your person looks like this. It'll it'll still look like there's a person here, but, and there will be other objects like like cars, and like some buildings, right? So you, it's still there's no reason to use like you know rectangular filter because your in your Im visual information will still be you know will still be intact basically. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. All right. As I said, so as I said, you need to uh, define four parameters when you're defining your confident, when you're constructing your confident using PyTorch. So if you look at this, this is your confident, 2D confident uh, command or, or, or PyTorch command, basically. And you need to have how so you need to define how many channels there are in your input. So if you are given like 32 by 32 by three image, then this should be three. And your output channel, this output channel is the number of filters. So let's say we're using 64 filters. Kernel size being, if you're using three by three, then this is three. Uh, stride one, padding zero. So if, you, if, if you're okay with, you know, if you're okay with your uh, activation map being smaller than your input image, then padding zero is okay. But if not, then you should use padding one. And uh, dilation, group, and bias, they're all, dilation is another, another concept that you might be able to use when you're using like 1D convolution, but we, we won't get into that. Uh, group convolution, not sure what this is. Uh, bias, of course, there's a bias term. So yeah, you need to at least define these, like one, these, these are like must, and then these are kind of like, there are default values. All right, moving on. So the details will be given in the practice session this Thursday. Ah, it's already 11.42. This is, this is not good. All right, I guess some of the material must be talked, must be discussed this Thursday, I guess. All right, pooling. So as I said, uh, okay, we, we don't have that information. We don't have the example, but uh, so usually what people used to do or people still do is after some number of convolution layers, you use pooling to contract your contract your activation map spatially. Uh, so what you do, what you can do is given a, for example, you have a 64 by 64, Six, uh, some, I'm sorry, so this is your channel 64. This is your width and height, which happens to be two, 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 two to four, two to four. So two, 224, 224 by 64 uh, activation map. And you want to contract the, uh, the dimensionality width and height without doing any calculation, without any learnable parameters, without any additional parameters. You want to downsample it, then you can use pooling. So you can just somehow, you can just suddenly uh, half, half it. So two to four, two to four into one, one, two, one, one, two. How you do it is actually, it's pretty simple. You just have a two by two map, two by two filter, which, and you, you have a two by two filter with stride two. And each time you just pick the maximum pixel value or, or feature value in your two by two region or two by two patch. So here, the maximum value is six. So you get six here. You, you move on with stride two, and then next time you pick eight, so you have eight here, and then you move stride two, and then you have three here, three, four here, four, so that's how you get uh, from four by four to two by two output. And no, there, yeah, it's a deterministic operation. You didn't do any, like, you know, weight, you, you, there's no weight parameters involved here, so it's just simple mechanistic, cal mechan mechanistic calculation. And it is called max pulling, it's because you take a max value in your patch and that's it. And this, there's of course average pulling, which is obviously you just take the average value in your, in your patch. So which, which would be like two plus 11, 13. So divided by four. So that's like 3.25. Uh, you do this for like two plus four plus seven plus eight divided by four. And you get some, some, some value here again and again. So that's average pulling. Uh, 
I think people use max pulling a bit more often than average pulling. So because max pulling has this semantic meaning where you only take the most relevant or most the strongest feature in a given patch. That's like the semantic meaning of max pulling. So yeah, there's like every every so often, like maybe you do convnet, you do convolution operation maybe two times or three times, and then you slide in some pulling, and then you do this again, slide in, slide in. That's where pulling comes in. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, so the summaries are convnets are usually stacked with convnets plus non-activation map, non-activation unit, which is usually a value, uh, pulling operation, and some final fully connected layers. And uh, these days, uh, people usually use smaller filters, which are three by three, which, as I said, has the benefit of being able to you see the same side, the same receptive field with long with deeper layers so it has both benefits it's using a smaller number of parameters and more nonlinear activation and the trend is again interestingly getting rid of pulling and FC layers we just use conv layers and what you so what you could do with pulling uh, which is just you know contracting the the spatial dimen space dimension that you can do with stride actually you can use stride two to contract it and then another stride two to contract it again and again and again so you can actually achieve the same effect as pulling um, and FC layer as I said people don't use like repeated FC layers before the final output prediction uh, so people use something called like global average pulling GAP something like that these days which uh, which is used by Inception and ResNet. So when we talk about Inception and ResNet, I'm going to talk about global global average pulling. All right. So yeah, historically, it's usually some repeated number of convnet and ReLU, convolution operation and ReLU, so n number of times. And then you slide in a pulling operation. And then you do this multiple times, like m number of times. So here, uh, one, two, three. So m equals three here, m equals three. And then some final uh, fully connected layers with non-activation, uh, non-linear activation functions. So here it was, well, I, I didn't draw it here, but so, some number of times and then do the final soft mix. Yeah, recent events such as ResNet, InceptionNet, they don't, they don't really do this though. All right, uh, okay, before moving on, Smaller filter, got small F goal, deep filter, deep filter, deeper filter, deeper architecture, deeper filter, deeper filter, and small filter, and big filter, and big filter. And then, does that loss of spatial information pulling effect? Uh, pulling effect doesn't lose spatial information. You just lose, you just contract it rather deterministically. So you don't really, you, you, you still retain the strongest signal in each patch, right? So you're not losing the entire thing. You're losing, I guess, irrelevant information or maybe like smaller signal. If you think about, you know, if you think about matrix factorization or eigenvalue decomposition or, or singular value decomposition. Sometimes you just throw away uh, ranks with smaller values, like, you know, like smaller eigenvalues. It's the same, you could think about this analogous. You just throw away smaller signals and you just retain the stronger signals and you're still okay with that. Deep architecture, no filters, layer of mango, this means deeper layer, deeper, deeper layer. Automatic All right, so there's something called, I mean, obviously, as I said, convnets are usually used for 2D images, but you can use it for 1D sequence. For example, 
uh, it could it could be used for processing sentences or audios or time any time series like you know like sensor like climate sensor data or stock stock prices data something like that. So if you have a one D one dimensional sequence like this, then you can have you can slide your three filter. So it's not three by three; it's a three by one actually. So three by one filter, like you slide it, and then you move on to the next one, the next one, the next one. So this is stride one. If you use stride two, it'll be here, here, and then here, right? So it's the same principle. It's just one dimensional compared to two dimensional. So there's a uh, quite a like a seminal paper from uh, Yun Kim, which is using confidence for sentence classification. So before, like, well, not before, but like you know, it was usually common sense to use re recurrent neural networks (RNN) for doing anything with with text or sentences but this paper actually empirically showed that you can use comments for doing actually there was a paper before that by uh i forgot the name it's the people from uh yeah james weston or jason weston and uh, i forget so weston and colobert basically um for, i forgot their first name but they were the first ones to use neural networks on natural language processing tasks. But this one kind of like explicitly used confidence for sentence classification. And what they did is so like your, your word has a word embedding. So this is a single word embedding. And this is uh, another word embedding for four. And then you can use like confident filters in a one dimensional manner. So your confident filter will stride like this and then your red filter, so there's red filter, like this is two by two by uh, embedding dimension, word embedding dimension, and then you can obtain a single output. Another two by your embedding dimension, you get this one output. And here, uh, uh, so there's like, basically there's like a, not, a lot of different filters basically. So uh, some filter has two by embedding dimension, some filter has three by three by different diff, three by uh, embedding dimension and you can obtain multiple different uh, activation outputs activation maps and then you can concatenate it and then do the final like you know yes or no classification or some, some classification basically uh compared to that there's of course uh so here channel means you know i guess different meanings of your text like in, in images, different channel was responsible for like different boundaries or different colors and something, some such as something like that. And here in NLP, uh, different channels might mean different semantic meanings, like whether some sentence or some word is like positive or some word is like negative or some word is related to person or some word is related to verbs or nouns, something like that. Train with channel hanging yeah, I'm not really sure how the architecture works. You can just read the paper. Um, I mean, all the principle that we've learned so far can be used in the same manner in 1D sequence. And of course, in 3D sequence as well. So this is like 3D sequence being like 3D tensor being videos or CT scans or MRI scans. So in, especially in medical imaging papers or research, you see 3, 3D confidence quite often. So your image is now, your your input is three dimensional now because uh, so this is your width this is I oh know this is your width this is your this is your height and now you have temporal axis this is your time dimension because you have like like sequence of images uh, so now you have a three dimensional kernel instead of having a two dimensional kernel moving on like moving around your image now it's three dimensional so. A three-dimensional cube is converted to a single output here, and then you slide your three-dimensional feature or three-dimensional filter. You a three-dimensional filter throughout this region. Uh, maybe I could use red here. So here, and then here, 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 until you reach this area. And then you get this one like this, right? 
So yeah, it's computationally more expensive actually. All right, so yeah, uh, you, yes, yeah, so again, like strides, filter size, uh, the number of filters, the padding, all that, all that is applicable in 3D confidence as well. Yeah, yeah, so difference between 2D and 3D is because it's just that in 2D, you, you slide it like this, like this. I mean, computationally, you don't slide it, you just, you just do it everything in parallel. You just you you calculate the entire thing just in, in one go using your using your GPU. But you know, it, 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 for for uh, diagram for, for you know explain uh, for instruction purposes or education purposes, you, you, we usually say that it slides like this. In the same manner, your con confident filter in three dimensional space it'll slide like like this, and then of course there's this dimension as well. So. This could be like time or, or length. All right, uh, okay. Moving on. All right, so yeah, we have only five more minutes, I guess. Uh, let me talk about dropout first. And then if for, for those of you who have more time, I'm gonna talk about batch norm, which is gonna take maybe 10 to 15 minutes, I guess. And uh, if you don't, uh, for those who need to leave, you can check out the details. I mean, uh, what the batch norm is about on YouTube. So, all right, let me just go to dropout first. Yeah, dropout, it was, yeah. Actually, it turns out that it was used in AlexNet in 2012, but the, uh, the theoretical, the paper itself about dropout was proposed in 2014, I think, by Je uh, Jeffrey Hinton. Well, I mean, from Jeffrey Hinton's group, actually. So the idea is really simple, but it just ha it happens to work really well. I mean, these days, these days, I don't think people use rely on dropout as much as they did before. But uh, like for like four or five years, maybe right, starting from twenty fourteen, maybe up to twenty eighteen, like dropout was like an essential part of training a deeper network. So the idea is really simple. If you have a fully connected layer, if you have a fully connected network. This is your input, this is your hidden layer, and this is your final, so another hidden layer, and then you maybe you have a H2, H1 input, and this is your output. You just, so you, you randomly, oh, okay, so I guess, uh, yeah. Let, let's just say this is another hidden layer, H, H0. Uh, so you randomly select a certain portion, certain percentage, of your input or, or of your hidden node and just deactivate it. Just, you know, set its value to zero, basically. So that's what's happening here. You, uh, there's a certain percentage that you need to set as a hyperparameter. So here there are five nodes, five hidden nodes, and you're on average turning off two nodes per layer. So that's what, 40%, right? So P equals 40%. So dropout percentage 40% and then on average. So you sample at each layer, you sample, uh, you stochastically sample how many layers, what, which layer you want to turn off. So basically it's a Bernoulli, Bernoulli trial. So it's a binomial trial. So like for here, you, you, you do sampling here, 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 here with chance of 40%. And then if you hit, if you hit success, then you turn it off. So set it to zero. And setting it to zero means you're, you're actually disconnecting all the weight parameters that's supposed to be here, like all the weights that was supposed to be connected to here, it is all turned off. It is all turned off. So the information from this node is not propagated into the next layer. And in the same manner, in the next layer, you do the same thing and you, you sample the hidden node with uh, a deactivation probability. And then this time you happen to sample three, three nodes and then two nodes here, and then that's it. That's, that's the spirit of dropout. And what it does is basically you're because you're disconnecting your hidden node you're actually uh decreasing the power of your network basically because you're not using the entire weight parameters that was given to you in the entire network you're not using that you're stochastically turning the you're, you're disabling the weight parameters prob probabilistically from each layer to another layer 
And that means you're using less number of parameters. And that means you're using, you're decreasing the power of your network, which means just simply it's a regularization. I mean, it's a very, on a, it's a very particular form of regularization compared to like L2, L1 regularization. This is a, another form of like stochastic regularization, but it turns out to work really, really well, especially for using fully connected layer, fully connected networks. Uh, it just, it, yeah, it's, maybe you could think of this as like a denoising autoencoder. Like you, 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 you put noise into your inter, into your hidden layers. And then be, in order to overcome that noise, your network must be really robust to that noise. You, it must learn to adapt, it must adapt to pick up very important signals given these noises. So that's the spirit of dropout. And you can actually use that for confidence, actually. So for example, when you slide your filter on, on the entire image and then you, you obtain a single activation map, you can probabilistically turn off the value in your values in your activation map. Like, you know, probabilistically, maybe 10%, 20%, whatever. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, turns out it doesn't, it, it's, well, I mean, I've read from papers that it doesn't work that well, actually. Yeah, no, like partially disabling your activation map doesn't really, isn't really that beneficial. Uh, but people have, people use a lot of variations. Uh, people actually, you know, you can actually drop the entire activation map. So if you have, uh, if you use three, uh, if you use six, three by three by three filters, then you can obtain six activation maps and you can just probabilistically deactivate the entire activation map. So here I just uh, colored black uh, for those that will be dropped. So here, this one's black, this one's black. So you can just drop the entire activation map. So this is another way to use dropout. And sometimes people even drop the entire layer, like there's drop layer. Like if you have like hundred different, like if you have a uh, hundred layer confidence, then you can just drop the entire layer Depend and you can just propagate the uh, information using residual connection. So people do that as well. Uh, these days, I'm not sure if dropout is as essential as before. People use self-supervised learning or augmentation very often these days. So, uh, yeah, as I said, dropout is a form of regularization. And these days, regularization techniques are uh, not as, I mean, I guess this is my personal opinion, not as, uh, yeah, not as considered as yeah, considered not as essential as before. Uh, there are a lot of different techniques to use, like fully exploit the power of your network. Uh, I mean, regularization is usually when your power, when your model power is assumed to be like bigger than necessary. So it, you want to use regularization regularization to prevent overfitting, right? Uh, but these days, there are a lot of different techniques to use, like effectively or efficiently use the power of your network using like augmentation or self-supervised learning and, or, or using like tremendous amount of data, something like that, or using transfer link, whatever. So uh, these days, I don't, I'm not sure if regularization is regarded as, as essential as before. Right, yeah, okay. So that's the, that's the end of dropout. Yeah, in order to talk, uh, that's a good question. So that means uh, if you probabilistically drop different activation map, that means you're sometimes you're using like if you have uh, one, two, filter number one, two, three, four, five, six, you have six filters. And sometimes you, you drop two and four. Sometimes you use I'm sorry, sometimes you drop five and six, sometimes you drop four and six, right? It's probabilistic, so it's dropout. So you, you sample which ones to drop, right? right? So you are using different combination of filters from time to time. And the because of that, the upper layer must learn to adapt to using different combination of, of filters. So that uh, So that's why it makes it robust. So even though your true power of your model is is like you know is powerful, but because you're using dropout, it is learning to adapt to uh, use smaller information, probabilistically, basically. Yeah. 
呃，也학생의학습활동은 drop out 하고실제로 inference 된 drop out 하지않는데이게 drop out 라면은사실은이게그한번에사용하는그노드의개수가작으니까이아웃풋의총총아웃풋의그밸류자체가줄어들거든요줄어들거든요근데이제이걸 inference 때는 drop out 안사용하기때문에이아웃풋의총매그니튜드가커진효과가있는데이걸이제또오프셋을해줘야되거든요그래서뭐실제로드랍아웃코드를보면은그걸이제뭐맞춰주는코드부분이좀있습니다아프로닝 I'm not really sure. If... So pruning is when you when you want to fully learn, fully train the network, and then you just uh, extract essential part of your model to convert that to a smaller model. Like you, you like for like for example, like you, uh, if certain part, if certain weight parameter in your fully fully trained model is like zero, then that weight is not doing anything. So you can actually just remove that. So you can do that kind of thing. That's called pruning. And I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how dropout is connected to pruning. But again, I'm not an expert in pruning, actually. All right, moving on to uh, batch norm. Uh, uh, give me just a second. Let me see if I have any. Give me maybe 20 seconds. All right, yeah, okay, so 12.25 is probably the longest I can go. All right, hope I can finish that. So uh, normalization, so batch norm, batch norm is, so training technique, we're gonna talk training technique, batch norm and dropout, we just talked about dropout, so we, are, we have only the batch norm to go. Uh, batch norm is batch normalization, so we need to talk about normalization first. So usually, usually when we, usually we pro pre-process the input to the deep learning networks by normalizing it. So normalizing it, which means usually you, uh, like Z normalization, like assuming that your input distribution is like you know, normally distributed, you, like Gaussian distributed, then you can normalize it by uh, like, you know, Z equals X minus mu divided by your standard deviation, right? So this is your Z value. Hope this is like, you know, we've, we've learned that in high school, right? So this is how you normalize your input data. So just like here, so it's usually a good idea to normalize your input. Uh, and okay, so that, that's normalization. I just wanted to re do a re slight recap on normalization. And now we need to talk about distribution shift. So distribution shift is a quite a challenging concept in machine learning, not, not just deep learning, but in machine learning, for example, if your test data, are wildly different from your training data. So if your test data distribution is different from training data distribution, for example, if you train your network on MNIST and you're trying to test it on CIFAR or Cypher 10, but let's, let's say that they're of the same, same uh, resolution, 24 by 24. And this is also grayscale. Let's just, let's just assume that. Or maybe, maybe your training data is on MNIST from from one to four and your test data is your from five to nine, right? So this, uh, th there's like vast difference between the training data distribution and test data distribution. And obviously your model won't work, model won't work that well because, because of the distribution shift. Your distribution has shifted from training to testing. So machine learning models are usually very vulnerable to distribution shift. Obviously it, it won't work. So. Uh, there's this, so this is your data set distribution shift, but the same distribution shift can occur internally. Uh, internally, meaning that if you have multiple hidden layer, so this is your, this is your input and distribution shift can occur between here, this layer, this layer, and this layers, because, because in, in this layer's perspective, this is the input to this layer, right? 
And if this, this distribution changes, that is a distribution change for this layer, right? So this, this is what, what's called the internal distribution shift, or sometimes it's called internal covariate shift. So batch normalization paper calls this internal, bat, internal covariate shift. Uh, uh, there are some questions. Uh, Chang Yun name is the probability to probability for dropout of fixed value. Uh, it is usually fixed, but you can try to tune it as you as you train your network. You can start by maybe I don't know forty percent, and then after like you've trained it for quite some time, maybe you can downsize it to ten percent. I'm not sure if people do that, you could, but you could do that. Projectile 관련한 질문 있습니다. 그, 아 프로젝트 얘기를 안 했구나. 아 죄송합니다. Oh sorry. I should have talked about the project first before talking about dropout. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, 1번, 2번 다 왔습니다. Yeah. You only need to compress your synthetic images, thousand of them, and then just submit that. You don't need to submit any code or anything. There is no time for six TAs and myself to go through 300 different codes. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do that. So just. Train your network. You can use DC again, or you can use whatever. Actually, you can use, but hopefully, you can just. Yeah, it's it's a practice. It's kind of extended practice session, so you can use whatever network of your preference and just generate one thousand different synthetic images and submit that. That's it. Kim Song Min, training is high on Han. Sample the Han. Normalization EX of. Uh, if you're talking about this, this slide, then yes, we're support, we're assuming that we don't have access to test data. So you, when you normalize it, you normalize. So these values are derived from the training data and you, you reuse this value to normalize your test data. That's a good point. Uh, uh, okay, so since a lot of people are asking about this uh, project, let's just, before we finish the batch norm part, let's just go with the project one. So, uh, yeah, objective is to generate faces with GAN, and the model is DC GAN or anything of your choice. You can use anything of your choice. And the data set is Celebe. Celebe is downloadable from PyTorch. Uh, torch vision data sets, just like in the same manner as we've downloaded them, this data set. Uh, there's a caveat. So sometimes Celebe won't be downloadable because there's a download quota per day. Like if like it, mil it reaches like million, 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 download, million downloads, then it'll shut down. So you can try that after some amount, some like period, some duration, some time, time duration. So yeah, I'll write, I'll, yeah, I'll write that on the class I'm about that. Resolution is 64 by 64, so you need to pre-process that to because the original image resolution is 218 by 178. So you need to you need to rescale re that using this particular command. And uh, yeah, evaluation score is FID score. So just generate 1,000 fake samples and calculate. We're going to calculate target FID. We're going to calculate the FID score, and if it's below 20, it's a pass. Uh, yeah, and uh, submission. So yeah, submission is format is you compress it, compress your 1,000 synthetic images into student number tar gz, and then upload it on KLMS. I've already active. I've already uh, uh, prepared an assignment in KLMS, and the due date is. I'm sorry, I didn't talk about this. The due date is uh, two weeks from now, actually, which is. Yeah, it's 27th. Uh, I'm not sure if it was 27th, uh, 0 a.m. or 23.2359 p.m. Uh, um, yeah, I'll just clarify that on class. Uh, they, uh, neighbor 분들은 제 이메일로 그냥 전, 전달해 주시면 되겠습니다. 네. 네, 이번 주 프랙티스, 이번 주 프랙티스랑 상관이 없는데 이미 겐 프랙티스를 들으셨으면은 뭐 어떻게 하실지 대충 잘 아실 것 같은데요. 이미 겐때 
24바이 24 엠리스트를 어, 생성을 해보셨을 텐데 그거를 이제 데이터셋을 바꿔치고 셀레베이로 그 다음에 모델도 아, 풀리 커넥티드가 아니라 이제 개, 아, 컴브넷 계열의 뭐 DC겐 같은 걸로 바꿔치고 그래서 열심히 학습만 하시면 됩니다 사실 별로 어려울 게 없습니다 아 이미지는 이미지는 JPEG으로 해야 되는데 JPEG으로 하, 얘기를 안 했네 아 요거를 조금 더 보완을 해서 제가 클라스에 아예 뭐 따로 공지를 하겠습니다 JPEG으로 해야 되는데 그거는 제가 따로 공지를 하겠습니다 아, FD, FID 20 이하로 안 되면은, 뭐, 뭐안된 이유가 있겠죠. 뭐 사실 이미 논문으로 다 찾아본 거거든요. DC, DC 계을 돌리기만 해도 20 이하는 쉽게 찍습니다. 안 되면 안 되는 이유가 있을 테니까 그걸 파악을 하셔야겠죠. 뭐, 정안 되면 뭐, TA 분한테 여쭤보셔도 되고, 클래썸에다가 뭐, 질문을 올리셔가지고, 학생분들끼리 뭐 토론을 하셔도 되고, 그렇습니다. 네. All right, as I said, I'll just post a se separate project one announcement on Classum. Uh, just a bit more detail is required, I guess, like the format of your output, such as like JPEG, JPEG image or something like that. And uh, yeah. Uh, 천 개생 넘어가요 보통 FID 20. 자, 아, 좋은 질문이네요. 사실 저희도 뭐 TA 분들이 해보실 거라서 이거 한번 해보고 혹시 FID 스코어 조정이 필요하면 조정하도록 하겠습니다. 뭐 웬만하면 다 패스를 드리려고 넉넉하게 잡은 건데 뭐 한번 해보겠습니다. 저희도. Don't we need to don't we need to upsample for decoder like transpose convolution? Yeah, uh, this again already con involves transpose convolution. So if you just copy paste the this again example. So in 그러니까 practice, 저번 practice session에 이미 d c g 코드가 있거든요. 그거 그냥 갖다 복붙하셔도 됩니다. All right. uh, if you were there in the practice session in the last, uh, in the last Thursday, uh, we've already reused, we've, there was a d c g n segment which was for yours to use. So you can just copy paste that and then try to generate celibate faces. You don't need to learn about upsampling all that. It's just, you can just copy paste this again and that's it. 네, 오로지 FID 스코어만 중요합니다. 네. 네. 네, you don't need to submit anything else. Just 1,000 fake samples and that's it. And, uh, Yeah, we're going to do some basic duplicate checking. So if there's any duplicate, like if there's any cheating or like, you know, copying others, just simply just, you know, copy pasting other people's output and then just, you know, submitting that, that won't cause, that, that will cause problem, uh, a serious problem, but basic, actually, because so this course is already easy enough for everybody, hopefully easy enough. And I hope that people just don't copy paste other people's work. Uh, that's going to be, that's going to call for like academic, administrative action. So please don't do that. I don't want to go through all the paperwork and all that. So please don't do that. Yeah, you can totally evaluate your output with your own FID score. I'm hope I hope you can do that. So yeah, just uh, yeah, just evaluate your model with FID score and then just, you know, make sure that it, it reaches below 20 and then submit. Collab is Coda memory on the stagger bomb. Coda memory eroga. Memory eroga, you don't have to understand. You ship Saba, you ship Sar, Mohan, Minibachi, Bo, you ship Sajang, we don't do Hebacha, memory error, you don't have to understand. If you run into your memory error, please use smaller model and smaller batch size. This is, this probably won't be very difficult. It's a roll, roll, low resolution image. 64 by 64 is not that, not, not a, high resolution image. So I expect no serious obstacles or, or challenges in this project. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. Any more questions? I guess we don't have time to go through batch norm. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I have a, another meeting at one o'clock, so I can't go through. Can go over like. 25, I guess, 1225. So maybe next time. Batch norm, I mean, it's a very important, it, well, it has been an important technique for quite some number of years, but these days batch norm are not, not that much used in my, in my perception, in my opinion, uh, especially not in NLP. I'm not sure if it's a still a essential, like essential component in image class, like image domain. No, I can't do that because I have a, I have a meeting at 1 p.m. So I need to get prepared. So maybe next time. So if there are any more question about project one, uh, please let me know now. Yeah, in the practice session on Thursday, Let's go with the batch norm very quickly and then some popular architectures. May, I, oh yeah, I'll try to cut it within 30 minutes. And then for the remaining one hour, you can do practice session. It's gonna be implementing ResNet on your own, which is hopefully not that not that difficult. It's a very repeat. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, compared to like transformers, it's a pretty straightforward ar architecture. It's even more simpler than uh, inception it, which, which is here. So yeah, I think one hour would be enough. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, as I said, I was on the point of explaining about internal distribution shifts. So I'm just going to stop it here. What batch norm does is it focuses, it recognizes the uh, danger of, or, or, or the, uh, or the problem that internal covariate shift or internal distribution shift causes in a deep neural network, deep deep layer, I mean, deep neural networks. And, and the batch norm paper proposed a technique, which is batch norm to, to, uh, to remove, that, remove that internal distribution shift so that it will train faster and it'll be easier to train deeper networks and such and such. So it's a pretty seminal paper. Okay, so if there are no more questions related to project, then I'll just end the class today. Uh, and of course, as I said, I'll post a separate uh, project one announcement on Classum. And the uh, uh, due date is two, two weeks. I'm pretty sure it's enough, more than enough, actually. I think training a DCGEN for celeb A faces is like one day job, actually. So yeah, two weeks is more than enough. All right, then see you guys this Thursday. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yep, bye bye. Oh, yeah, 다음 주, 다음 주 다시 그 인트, 인터널 디스트리뷰션 쉬프트부터 다시 설명을 드릴게요. 네. All right, bye bye.